All right, everyone, welcome to the live stream. I'm gonna talk about sci-fi bugs some more. I'm gonna continue working on this uh, this design right here, and just wanna make sure that everything is good to go. If you all can't hear me or have any issues, just mention it in the chat. Um, but where we left off last time, uh, I was just starting to work on the legs and it's gonna work on the front legs. So as usual, what I'm gonna do is start with a brief kind of a comparison of uh, various insect legs uh, from some of the models that I've created in the past and also do a short demonstration, a uh, little comparative uh, anatomy between uh, insect legs and human, well, let's say insect limbs and human limbs. So let's uh, take a quick look, a little perusal through some of the other insects. So this is our sci-fi insect that I'm making up for this uh, live stream. Let's take a look at some other insects here. And right we have right here is a model of a leaf cutter ant, one of my favorites, uh, favorite ants. As you can see, it has very powerful jaws. This is a worker. This is one of the ants that actually cut up the leaves. Um, and take a quick look at the, the legs here. What I like about ants is uh, the anatomy is very simplified. You can kind of see the various parts of the leg here. I have the uh, coaxer right here and the trochanter. And this is the femur, the tibia, the metatarsi, and then the little tarsi in the foot right here. Tarsus, tarsi, I always mix those up. What I wanted to point out on this particular um, insect, I'm going to take a look at this on some of the other insects too. Sometimes it's more pronounced, sometimes it's a little more subtle, but this is a, a great example right here, a very slight S curve that you see in the shape of the limb right here, the longer limbs. And you can see it here in the tibia as well. And it's this kind of S shape that I think gives insect legs a lot of uh, elegance to them, even if it's very, very subtle. You can even see it in the antenna. Think of the antenna of, uh, of an insect as being almost like modified legs in a way. They have similar joints. You know, these are almost the segments of the antenna right here, are almost like the uh, the tarsi right here. And then this would be more like the metatarsi right here. And uh, or metatarsus, again, I'm not a Latin speaker, so I'm probably mixing that up. Um, let's take a look at some other ones. Here is uh, one of my favorites. This is, I'm assuming that ZBrush doesn't quit on me here. Okay, this is uh, an orchid bee, probably my favorite insect right now. Um, and you can see its legs are a little bit wider here. And you can also see that the front legs, mid legs, and hind legs are very different. But you do get a little bit of that S-curve in there um, in some of the skinnier parts. Now you can sort of see here, the back legs, things get super wacky. And this is partially because uh, it's a pollinator and... Uh, not sure if orchid bees per se have like a pollen basket, but you know, when pollinators, they often, the uh, pollen will bunch up on the, especially with honeybees anyways, on the hind legs here, and they'll be able to carry the the, uh, the pollen back to the hive. But orchid bees, I believe, are solitary, but they, regardless, they still have this kind of wacky, kind of uh, elongated leg right here. But you can also see the S-curve is still present right there. So these are the kinds of things that if you're doing a creature, for um, uh, an insect inspired creature, those subtle little things that will make the difference between being kind of a blah design and something a bit more interesting and inspired. That S curve. Uh, let's see what we have a Katie did here. This is going, here's a Katie did. This one a bit straighter in terms of the leg segments, but you can see a little bit of a bend here at the start. And this one actually has, yeah, you have a little bit of a bend here, just a slight bend right here. So let's take a look as why why we might have these curves in here. Okay, this this one right here doesn't have much of an S curve at all, but it does have that little bend right here in the beginning. So I'm going to briefly 
switch over to Maya. And I want to show you guys, this is a, a model I made for a long time ago for a demonstration, the difference between insect legs or insect limbs and uh, human limbs. So we have here, over here on the left an extremely simplified version of an insect limb. And what we have over here on the right is a human arm. I'm just showing the muscles here the, of the upper arm. I don't have the muscles of the lower arm here. Um, and I had these set up as an animation. So if I kind of scrub through the timeline, what you're going to see is that, you know, the main difference between an insect leg and, say, a mammalian leg or a mammalian limb is that with insects, the muscles are the inside of the skeleton. And on a, um, well, in this case, a human arm, the muscles are the, on the outside of the skeleton. The skeleton supports the muscles. And, of course, we have the skin on top of it. But the main similarity between the two is that we, generally speaking, we're working in opposing pairs. Now, this is extremely simplified, obviously. This is a bit more accurate in terms of the muscle setup. But these, these um, muscle pairs are always pulling. They're never pushing. They're always pulling. So one is contracting while the other is relaxing or the other one is stretching. So you can see how on this side, the red muscle is contracting, pulling the limb up, and the blue muscle is uh, stretching. So it's relaxed, it's not activated, the red one is activated, and then when it pulls it in, the blue muscle is activated, pulling the bottom here in this kind of lever, while this one is relaxed and it's st stretched out. So it's still muscle pairs, they're still only um, contracting and relaxing, they're not pushing, they're always pulling. Same with the, the, the human arm over here, right? When we have the bicep is um, contracting, pulling the arm up, while uh, the triceps are, I'm probably getting the name of the muscles wrong, but I'm more familiar with insects. Um, these muscles here are relaxing. So it's still pairs of muscles, right? Think of this as one pair and this is one pair, or this is the red and this is the blue. So hopefully that makes some kind of sense, right? So there is a similarity between insects in, and, and mammals in that respect. So the reason I point this out is if we look at this lever here and the way this is organized, it kind of helps to explain why you might get that bend in the uh, leg or that even that slight S curve to accommodate this kind of lever action, right? So let's go back to ZBrush because this is a ZBrush live stream and take a look at some other uh, insect models. All right, here's a good example. This is our, um, our Japanese hornet. And you can kind of see where you might have that lever on the inside here of the joint pulling this leg muscle, either, you know, pulling it out or pulling it in, but always pulling. Again, we have that kind of S curve right there. Hopefully that's a decent enough explanation is to give you some inspiration. Here on this side, you can really see it's kind of exaggerated. Imagine that lever being right there and the muscles pulling on the inside. Thanks very much. I really appreciate the, uh, the compliments and those of you who have been uh, following this uh, stream. I hope you are learning some stuff. I never get tired of talking about it or reading about it. Here, of course, is we, now we have some craziness going on with our, uh, our mantis. These are still legs, even though we kind of sort of uh, tend to think of the front legs as arms because they kind of look like arms. And these have been obviously greatly exaggerated because, of, you know, thanks to uh, adaptation over the millennia, you can see how the front legs have turned into these giant claws that snap shut. But you can still see that curve right here. You can imagine those muscles right here pulling that pivot and snapping it closed there so it can kind of clamp down on its prey. But we'd still have that kind of like little bit of a bulge here to accommodate. And there is kind of a, I mean, there's a curve to it, maybe not a strict S curve, but there is a curve to it. And if we take a look at the other legs, a little bit subtle. I mean, these guys are kind of straight, but you can still see that curve right there. So that's something that I kind of want to bring into my, um, my current design here. chat visible here 
Okay. So let's go and take a look at our... Now we're doing a wasp or a wasp inspired design. So I want to kind of keep that wasp kind of thing in mind as we work. Let's see if we can find it. There we are. And I want to kind of manipulate this a little bit to make the pose a little bit easier. So we have the, we have the coxa here, the tucanter, femur, tibia, and then down here we're going to be making the segments of the metatar excuse me, the metatarsi and the tarsus. And of course we're going to take a sip of beer. All right, let's get the old Cintiq going here. And I'm going to turn on the solo button. And we should have these as polygroups. Yes, we do. So I'm going to control click on this basket and maybe Just put a slight bend in here. And mask this and W alt click right here. And bend this up a little bit. And then let's uh, alt click on this. Actually, let's do this. Control click on this. Whoops. Control shift click on this. Control A to mask all. W alt click right here. And let's put a little bend right here. Just so we have a better idea of what's going on. You know, wasps are going to vary quite a bit in terms of their, uh, the way that their legs look. I mean, these guys, this one's kind of thick. The back leg right here, this is sort of the mud dauber, which is one of our inspirations here. You can see the uh, the S-curve right there and the joint right there. So there's the coxa, there's the trochanter. You know, I don't know if the trochanter's, trochanter, you know, in terms of the function, not quite sure exactly how, it doesn't really function as a movable segment as far as I know. But um, what I'm going to do is let me make sure that I have Z intensity up here. There we go. Kind of make it look like a cup that's coming around here. And I have these, uh, each segment is separate polygroups, and I also have the symmetry turned on. So I'm using, taking advantage of that mask by polygroup. So this slider right here allows me to move each polygroup individually just by touching on it without having to constantly mask something even though it's all part of the same subtool. and just as a reminder this mask by polygroup slider is found in the brush palette i put it into custom interface right there sorry my fingers hitting the camera there but if you go to the brush palette under auto masking it's this slider right here and then so here is a place where i kind of want to exaggerate that kind of joint that sort of kind of a little bit of an S-curve right there. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get just the basic shape in here. I think I want to pull this back a bit. I think it's too... I want to make the femur look a little bit longer. So maybe bring this down a little bit more subtle. That looks better. Once I get the basic shape of these parts, I'm going to do a quick Z remesh so that uh, it's a little bit easier to work with. Maybe I'll inflate this a little bit. I kind of like slender legs on, whoops, that's a bit too much. Slender legs on, on this uh, particular wasp, so I'm not gonna make them too thick. Um, how to retopo sharp structure in legs and hand? Any tips? Well, um, it depends. Um, are you talking about human hands or, or uh, insect parts? I'm kind of focusing mostly on insects tonight, but I would say that, um, you know, for a quick retopology, Z remesh is great. If you want to do um, more precise topology within ZBrush, then I would use the Z modeler brush. What I would do is kind of sculpt your hand, maybe in Dynamesh, 
and then use Z modeler kind of to um, with the extrude option to kind of create a cage around it and then the topology itself of course is it depends on you know how you're going to uh, rig and animate it but um, that's the kind of the approach that I would take overall that's a little bit too thin um, with, with with this stage, I like to do Z remesh just to get a kind of quick and dirty topology going. I might get more of a flare down here. And since you know insect legs are kind of like straight up tubes, then um, you can get away with doing like a Z remesh. And uh, if you really need to go back and do like a hand topology, I try to do like what I'm calling hand to hand or by hand topology, I mean using Z modeler to do quad by quad to make out the topology. Uh, I only do that when I absolutely have to because it's time consuming. But um, the Z remesh algorithm is actually pretty good at um, avoiding spirals. It's not perfect, but it's a lot better than it used to be. So let's pull this out a little bit. And so this is going to be the meta tarsi right here. So. A little bit of an S curve like this. I mean, I kind of use Z Modeler the way that I used to use Quad Draw in Maya. It is very similar. So this is going to be kind of like a cup here. So let me go down here to uh, S Claw. Brush. Uh, let's reset this brush. Reset current brush. It's too much. Bring down the intensity. It's too much. So right now, these different parts of the leg are in kind of a dynamesh state. So if I turn on the line you can see this is what the topology looks like. So I use um, Dynamesh is kind of a rough out sketching kind of uh, tool. And um, uh, once I have the basic forms, then I'll go in here and do a Z remesh to get a better topology so I can create um, subdivision levels. And that makes it easier to smooth as you go up and down in levels of subdivision. A little bit of, I kind of want to put an indentation there for a little bit of a cup right here and then this is one of the first uh, tarsi so what I'm going to do is I'm going to cheat I'm going to kind of model this get it to a certain point and then just duplicate it because uh, these are going to be fairly simple or it's fairly similar each one each um, each segment is going to be really sim similar to each other, so don't want to have to model it too many times, or don't want to have to waste time modeling each one individually if I don't have to. And that's the same thing I'm doing for the legs, right? I'm going to spend a lot of time on these front legs, and then I'm going to duplicate them once I have them in a good spot, and then duplicate the legs and use the same, use that as a basis for the mid legs and the hind legs, since wasp legs are fairly similar, unlike you know, like mantis legs, you know. So make this kind of like a flared cup here, kind of like this. The other things, I tend not to use creasing too much. That's my own bias. I think creasing is, is great for like hard surface modeling, but I tend to do more organic modeling. I just like to and maybe it's just an old school thing. I don't know. Well, not the creases is, is fairly new, um, but I just like to insert the edge loops as needed when I when I need to have them there <clears throat> to create kind of a harder edge. But I like I like organic modeling because there's a lot of more freedom there. <clears throat> and like I said before, insects are nice kind of like 
somewhere between organic modeling and um, hard surface modeling. Kind of a weird middle ground. Then I'm going to go in here and kind of do this. So we got teardrop shape like that. I also want to pay attention to insect legs. There's often um, spikes. There's actually another cool thing I can put in here that you'll see in some insect legs. I'll take a look at a bee real quick. I'll show you what I mean. It's going to look a bit goofy for a while. It's looking better than it was, but I want to show you something really quickly on bee legs. Did this actually? Yes. Is this symmetrical? Yes. Okay. So let's uh, save this real quick. And well, real quick is relative. Okay. Let's go to Hymenoptera. This millifera, ZBrush. The one thing that bothers me when I see a lot of uh, creature design that's insect inspired is that they'll often like still have like very muscular kind of fleshy bits. I mean, it's not completely unheard of, like a fly abdomen tends to be kind of squishy, but I mean, it's an exoskeleton. So I would say embrace the exoskeleton and, and try not to do something that's in between. You know what I mean? Let me see if we can find the legs here. Front leg. Okay. Okay. Let's hide the scan. And just come down here to the legs. Sorry, this is taking a little bit longer than I would like. Okay, this is what I want to show you. On this part of the leg, this notch right here is kind of interesting. You'll see this on, on uh, many different types of insects. Okay, now this notch right here, so this is, we have the coxa, trochanter, femur, tibia, Bees' knees are actually cool, kind of cool. Um, we have this little spiky thing right here. And then here on the metatarsus, we have this notch right here. So what this notch is often used for is actually cleaning the antenna. If you watch bees or watch footage of bees, you can see that they're constantly cleaning themselves. And uh, they'll use this notch as a way to clean off their antenna. So you want to keep the antenna as clean as possible because it's one of the most sensitive parts of the uh, of the bee, that's how they sense their surroundings, right? Let's see if we get the head here. So here's our antenna, right? And so you'll see it's constantly taking its legs and cleaning out the antenna, kind of like this. So you don't see it in all the different insects, but sometimes you'll see it uh, in some of these guys. And so we can take advantage and, or steal that idea 
uh, when we get down here to the metatarsus. Maybe we'll put just a little bit of a notch in here just for, kind of for fun. Um, and it's easy enough to do while we're still in kind of a dynamesh state, right? So what I do is, let's do this. And then you'll also see often like big long spikes coming out of parts of the legs. These are often used as, you know, to help it when it's climbing things. You know, kind of like, uh, you know, spikes on cleats, you can imagine. Probably also other uses. Grasping that kind of stuff. So we're going to, we're going to put that notch in here, steal that idea. And see where it takes us. Straighten this out just a little bit. So the uh, when I was showing you the bee here before the hairs that you saw on there it was that was actually came through from the scan data. So it's kind of a messy thing. But the way that I usually do hairs. Um, in, in ZBrush, what I'll often do is I will actually literally, for larger hairs, I'll make a little piece of hair and either duplicate it and place them individually, like if I'm doing a fly or something like that and they have the big hairs. So I'll do that. I might use fiber mesh for smaller hairs and maybe convert that into polygons. If it's something that I'm animating, I'll often do in another program like Maya, I might do uh, Yeti fur or something like that. I'm not a huge fan of uh, X-Gen. I kind of like Yeti a little bit better. The reason I would use Yeti over fiber mesh is if I'm going to rig something and animate it, then um, I don't want to have to deal with trying to figure out how to rig fiber mesh. I'm sure there's some cool techniques and all that kind of stuff for doing it, but uh, I feel like for me, Yeti gives me enough flexibility that it makes it, it's one of the easier hair methods to use. I like the grooming tools in Yeti. Um, but fiber mesh will also work in a pinch, you know. Or another way to do it is you could use nano mesh. Um, you could create a, a, a nano mesh works pretty well. Um, of course, you're going to be placing it based on the topology of the model. Uh, but you can use that kind of randomness to use uh, random settings in nano mesh to kind of make a hair that goes all over, and then you just convert it into uh, geometry. Something like this. Let's do that. Okay, let's say that this is good enough as kind of a rough leg. Is there anything else I want to do? This a little bit bigger. One of the more difficult things to deal with when you're working with, I'm creating this guy from scratch, but I often use scan data as a place to start. Uh, if I'm doing something for a client, like right now I'm working for, on a lot of fly models and aphid models for uh, a museum in Germany. It's kind of a cool project, you know, creating kind of a digital library of insects, 3D models based on scans. So they had to be accurate. So, but the challenge is, of course, you know, insects tend to be very fuzzy, uh, depending on the bug. And so like, you spend a lot of time cleaning up the... Um, the schmutz and the other stuff that comes through in the scan as well as the hairs and, and stuff like that. So uh, it's a good skill to have them cleaning up scan data. Okay, so let's say that this is our basic leg here, front legs for our wasp. So what I'm going to do now, and I haven't done the foot yet, so maybe what I'll do is, well, let's do this. Let's do a Z remesh. So this is Dynamesh, as you can see. I'm going to control click on this part in the undo uh, slider to store the shape in history so that I can do projection and then I'm going to go down here to geometry and I'm going to choose Z remesh and let's just set this is 88,000 so I'm just going to set this to let's just do adaptive and I'll set the target polygon count to like uh, so that's 5,000 so let's do 10,000 and see what happens do a Z remesh. Hmm. Excuse me, let me undo that. One thing I forgot to do, let's keep groups. Try that again. There we go. So you can see the uh, 
Zero mesh is not too bad. Um, you can test really quickly whether or not you have spirals by holding control and shift and clicking on select lasso. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna control shift click on an edge here. And if I get a nice clean band around there, then that means that I don't have too many spirals. If you see like a, if, if, if it disappears and the, the, the edge loop kind of goes circles all the way down, then you've got some spirals and you might have to either read Z remesh or find some solution. It's not always possible to eliminate spirals, but you can see in this case, it, it does a really good job, the latest Z remesh algorithm. So I'm having a nice kind of fairly clean topology. I'm gonna do another Z remesh though and let's set this to half. Hang on. Try it again. Hopefully I did not crash. I crashed. Okay, well, that'll happen. Uh, let's go back in here and try it again. All right, so we lost about 10 minutes there. Sorry about that. Okay, let's try this again. Create a notch in here. Let's send them our max aspect polygroups. My favorite brushes to use, I love the, um, I mentioned this before, I love the brushes that, uh, let me see if we can bring this up again. My favorite brushes come in the SK pack. If you take a look at the Gumro for uh, Sakaki Karo, 
I can't pronounce his name. Karu. Sorry, I apologize, Sakaki. He's another ZBrush live streamer. Check out his live stream. He does great character anime manga stuff. But his brushes are awesome, and I love them, and I get them all the time. So I highly recommend them. If you get them, you can uh, you can donate some money to the cause. Uh, but my brushes, my favorite brushes of her, his that um, is the SK cloth brush. It's not really a dynamic brush because this is this came out before the dynamic brushes, but it's great for doing cloth curves, uh, cloth folds, and that kind of stuff. But I use it often, like I used to use the Damien Standard brush. I like the Damien Standard brush. I love his clay fill brush. I love his uh, clay tubes brush, his standard brush. So those are my favorite brushes to use. You know, obviously Move Brush, Z Modeler, um, Smooth, obviously. <coughs> Um, I like to use uh, Move in the Infinite Depth a lot, especially in Profile. Those are my favorite brushes to use. Hey Brazil, how you doing? Thanks for joining us. I'm just redoing something because I crashed. And I'm going to do it again. Hopefully not crash again. Let's do a save next. What do you say? And then I'm going to do a, a Z remesh. Okay, so let's try that again. Uh, blah blah blah. Geometry Z remesh. Let's set this to what did I say? Let's do five thousand. Okay, whoops, forgot to turn on key groups, key groups. There we go. And then set this to half. And uh, get it down even lower and turn off adaptive. All right, looks terrible, but that's a nice low polygon. Let's go back in time a little bit because I forgot to store a projection point. So control, whoops, control click right here. Store that in history, go up here. And let's do a quick divide, divide, and then uh, project history. That's a little too mangled. So let's do 0.01 for our distance. Let's do this. Let's see. I'll do project history and I'll just do a little cleanup here. That's why I don't spend a whole lot of time sculpting or trying to get things perfect in Dynamesh because I know I'm going to be projecting history and then doing a lot of cleanup after that. This is like, I don't know, I'm like crazy about it. do something real quick. I want to go back in time because I'm not crazy about how it did its Z remesh. 
And I think uh, I can use polygroups as a way to kind of guide this and make it a little bit better. I think I was rushing a bit too much. So let's do this. Okay, that's fine. Um, I'm going to mask this area right here and do Control W to create a polygroup. All right. And I'm going to do this. I'm going to mask right here. Control W to create a polygroup. I'm going to create a uh, mask right here. Control W to create a polygroup. Mask right here. Control W to create a polygroup. I'm going to use a polygroups to kind of hopefully guide the um, the Z remesh, make it a little bit better. Let's see if this will work. Control Shift click right here. I'm going to create a mask. Control W to create a polygroup. Mask right here. Control W, create a polygroup. Mask right here. Control W to create a polygroup. And I might also do this. Make like a cap right here. Control W. Let's see if this will do what I want it to do. Now I'm going to do geometry, Z remesh, and let's do adaptive. And I'm going to set this uh, polygon count. Let's do, let's see, uh, 25,000 adaptive keep groups and Z remesh. And so you can see how creating that polygroup there created kind of like a nice edge loop around that polygroup in terms of the topology. Same with right here. And even in the notch here, it's created kind of a little bit of a better edge flow. Not perfect, but a little bit better. And so let's do that again. Let's set this to half and see if we can get it to... I might not go quite as low as I did before because I think that was kind of messing up the design a bit. This is starting to get a little bit unwieldy, so I'll smooth that, but just an idea, something you can try when you're doing like a quick and dirty topology. Oops, let's go back a few steps. Something like that. Let's stick with this. That's not too bad. 22,000 is fine. You know, the other thing we could always do is... Um, I feel like we have too many edge loops right here. We can go in here and choose uh, Z Modeler. All right. And rather than using Z Remesh, and we have Z Remesh kind of establishing a basic topology, but what I could do right here is hover over an edge and choose Delete Edge Loop Complete and then go in here and start deleting edge loops just to kind of manually reduce the topology instead of having to, to um, try our luck with uh, Z remesh every time. Because what I want to do is maybe just reduce the topology here in the middle. I still want to have it somewhat dense because I want to sculpt on here some details. But this is a little bit too dense for me. This is slightly more time consuming, but you know, in a pinch it'll work. I mean, this is, this is going to end up being about three to four minutes worth of work, so why not? Like I said, if I can't get something that I absolutely want for the final version, I can always do hand retopology by using zero measure. Kind of funny to call it hand retopology when I'm still using a computer to do it. I can just reduce this just a little bit. And come in here and just remove a few of these. That's where we're going to get in the spiral, so I'll leave that alone. Just remove this. And maybe a couple of these. 
this is a little bit too dense down here. Kind of considering this sculpt is still a little bit of a concept sculpt. Okay, that's where we're getting the spirals. And then we'll just do... Almost done. Okay. All right, and then the the other thing I'm going to do before I subdivide this is. Um, Let's do a quick auto groups so that I lose these poly groups here in the middle of the segment, right? I should have lose a couple of these. Okay, so I'm going to do poly groups, uh, auto groups. And of course, my poly groups are no longer symmetrical. I could do merge similar groups. The other thing you could do is a geometry, uh, modified topology, mirror and weld. Not really gonna weld anything, but that way you can mirror the poly groups. Either way, that works fine. And let's, before I do anything else, I'm gonna go W for the gizmo. Uh, uh, control click on this uh, segment right here. I'm going to hold the control key and drag with the gizmo to create a duplicate of that mesh and do it again and then one more time. Let's take a look at our reference here real quick. Let's see the typical number of segments that you'd see in a wasp leg. This one has, we have the long one, one, two, three, and then the fourth is the foot. So we have the long one, one, two, three, and the fourth is the foot. Save a little bit of time in sculpting there. And I lost my pen. Let's save next. There we go. And have a sip of beer. Okay, do a little bit more shaping here with the move brush and the smooth brush. I'm going to hold the shift key and bring my smooth brush to Z intensity down so it's not so extreme. I think I have too much of a curve in there. And then go in here with the uh, plate brush. I like my blue material, makes it easier to see what's going on. So whenever I'm doing anything with topology, I'll use like that white material so I can 
easier time seeing the topology. And then when I do sculpting, I'll switch over to that blue material. So this is the notch that we're going to use, insect is going to use to clean its antenna. And then what I'm going to do is subdivide and start refining this a bit more. But at the low polygon, it's easier to get kind of some of these wobbles out in the form. There we go. Make it a little bit snugger. Snuggly. Snuggify. Snuggalicious. Might be a little bit too thin. Thicken that up a bit. save because last time it crashed when I tried to stop it. Let's take a quick look to see how it looks with our wasp. It looks alright. You know, I'll probably change the pose a little bit. Let's take a quick look at the feet of a wasp. So we're just going to do wasp foot. There we go. Some nice images here. Let's uh, throw this into our reference. Oh, that's nice. It's when you Google something like this, you're almost always going to get the nasty stings. So let's uh, images of stings. So let's hide that. And basically, what we're looking at is kind of like two large claws, and then maybe a smaller segment or a pair of segments right here, and some other stuff coming on. And then of course the hairs. I'm not going to worry about the hairs just yet. But let's uh, go in here and. You know, I haven't subdivided this yet, so what I can do is I can use things like, let's do this real quick. Let's make sure we have auto groups. So we'll do poly groups, auto groups, and then to make the group symmetrical, geometry, mirror and weld. And now we can take advantage of mass by poly groups, so it's a little bit easier to tuck these guys in and fix some of these issues. And we can also use an insert mesh brush what I'll do is I'll go in here with an insert mesh brush. Let's say IMM primitives. And just go zoink. Uh, I want to have a sphere here. And it's too high poly. Let's do this. There we go. Move. I like to move it. Move it. I like to move it. Move it. I've been hanging out with a five-year-old today, so that song is stuck in my head. Courtesy of Madagascar. This is why I like to use the, uh, the white material whenever I'm paying attention to topology. This might be a little bit big, so let's do this. Just wanted to establish something. Quick. 
go W and just duplicate this over. Maybe I'll do a third right here, but I'm going to squish this down. This is not down. All right. I don't know how detailed I want to get on the feet. You know, if I'm not doing something specifically with the feet, it's going to be very, very tiny in the final model. So maybe I'll just do something that's kind of implied here for the moment. Uh, let me clear the mask here and maybe make this look a little bit more unique as opposed to the rest of the other segments here. You guys have probably seen there's some cool images of spider feet. They look like little puppy paws, especially jumping fighters, spiders. They're really cool. Okay. Okay, so let's take a look. Everything symmetrical, looks that way. Okay. So save <clears throat> and one more thing I want to add here before I subdivide using good old insert mesh brush is a little spikety Acting funky, let's turn on. Uh, there we go. Local symmetry. Okay. Now we can do some sculpting. Control D to sub subdivide, and then I'm going to come in here. And Damien Standard Brush is kind of a nice one to use at this point as we start to dial in some, some more details so it doesn't look like a marshmallow so much. And, okay, I've got it to a million points. Let's duplicate, I mean, sorry, to subdivide one more time, so it's about four million points. And I'm gonna to start to kind of crisp up this edge here, but you also notice I'm going very loose and kind of sketchy because I wanna keep that kind of organic feel. I don't want this, this is not supposed to be a robot, it's supposed to be an insect. I'm gonna control shift click on this and maybe take, um, Let's do uh, TW clay tubes. Bring down the Z intensity a little bit and kind of use this as a way to hollow this out. So this is the Coke set that I'm working on right now. That's the first segment. And I kind of like to rough this up a little bit. Clay tubes with a low Z intensity is a great way to do this. Again, kind of like I was doing in the previous uh, live streams where I want to create kind of an, 
an underlayer of kind of organic messiness. So everything doesn't look too, doesn't look manufactured. It looks more organic. I'm not going to do super fine detail on this pass until I've already, you know, maybe duplicated the legs and I'll do that as a final pass. So I'm kind of doing sort of medium level detail at this point. Just to kind of get the basic idea. And I'm also still kind of playing with the shapes. I haven't quite finalized their overall shape, so I'm taking this opportunity as I add some kind of an organic kind of quality to it to kind of also refine the shape as well. So that I can kind of figure out what's going on with this bug. Increase this smooth Z intensity and then smooth this out a little bit. Switch over to that Demon Standard Brush. Or Dam Standard Brush, whatever you want to call it. And... Yeah, because on these edges here of the joint is where you're going to have a little bit of wear and tear. So, as I mentioned before, you know, insect exoskeletons are made out of a material called chitin which is kind of similar, think of it in a way, as kind of like your fingernails, right? A little bit tougher, slightly different, not exactly the same, but similar in quality, so that you want to have this kind of, you know, slightly damaged kind of quality to it, also to make it look like it's something that's grown as opposed to built, you know. So I'm kind of just roughing this up. I'm putting a little bit of I'm kind of like drawing lines and then smoothing them. Whoops. Hitting it with a smooth brush and just doing this kind of thing. I'm holding the alt key while I draw with this demon standard brush to kind of pull it out a little bit. And you also notice I'm going super fast. Like I like to go fast at this point. I don't want to like obsess over every little thing. I just want to kind of get a nice kind of cool looking organic shape without getting too wrapped up in every little detail. I'll do that at my last stage. So you can see how much more organic this looks than this. Let me take a look at our reference. Well, unfortunately it's not high enough res. This is super high res. And this is also a bit fuzzy, but um, if we look at the segments of the antenna right here, see how it's imperfect? You're getting that kind of damaged kind of quality there to each segment. You're giving kind of a unique quality to them as well. Down here, these parts right here, thinning, uh, alternating thick and thin parts. Let me see if we take a look at some of our other bugs here. So if you can ignore the hair, you can kind of see the sort of damaged parts. It's uneven. This is kind of cool in terms of the way the, the claw that's coming out of the bottom of the tibia looks. I might steal that idea a bit more because this is also a wasp. There's a beetle. So, kind of want to get that in here, and as we add super levels, fine levels of detail later on, we can make that look even cooler. But right for right now, I want to kind of like a basic level of damage. And then we'll just tuck this in just a little bit so it's not too bell-shaped. And let's go to the next one. This is the Trucanter. And again, maybe we'll start with the uh, Damien Standard Brush and start 
holding the alt key and just drawing out here. Again, I have my mass by poly group set to 100 so that if I'm drawing right here, it's not the line's not going to continue in the next segment. It makes it easier to kind of work quickly. But then, of course, I'll also control shift click on this to hide everything else so I can kind of scoop out the inside here with, uh, say, clay tubes or clay buildup, whatever you prefer to use. And just so that those segments are definitely overlapping. And I mentioned at the beginning of this li uh, live stream the muscles and the interior. I'm not going to sculpt that so much. Just kind of paying attention to the exoskeleton and imagining how the muscles on the inside of the exoskeleton might behave. Sometimes you get really high quality scan data, you'll actually have parts of the interior of the insect included. Of course, it looks like a mess. It's hard to understand exactly what you're looking at, but you can see some cool stuff going on there on the inside of the anatomy. Depends on where you get the scan data. Usually have, to get that kind of quality, you had to get directly from like a scientist or something like that. And I usually only get that when somebody hires me to make models for a museum or something like that. You know, scientifically accurate models, which is one of my favorite things to do. So again, working really fast here. Just to get the basic idea out. Since I have subdivisions, I can always step down, shift D to step down on subdivision level. And that allowed me to kind of shape this a bit more without losing any of the detail or too much of the detail that I just sculpted in there. So even now, I want to think about the silhouette. It's always a good idea to bring this up so I can really remember to pay attention to the silhouette from various different views. <clears throat> You know, I don't want to make these just generic blobs. I want to have some kind of visual interest here. And I want this edge to be a little bit uneven. Okay, so now we go down to the femur. And I'm going to take my uh, TW clay tubes and maybe dig this in a little bit. So I kind of like to use the clay tubes brush as almost like uh, sandpaper. So this would be fairly coarse sandpaper at the moment, just for shaping. And as I refined, I would use, you know, just like if you were doing an actual practical model, you'd um, use finer and finer sandpaper as you're going along. I might switch over to SK cloth and just Drag a line in there, make it a little bit more interesting shape. Kind of like a spoon. tubes and just start kind of scuffing up the outside to make this shape a bit more interesting. Looking at the profile. I 
That's cool. And we can always draw in like maybe SK cloth, low Z intensity, just, just so you don't lose it, maybe a little bit on that S curve. Just so you don't lose it. That looks a little bit more insectoid. Kind of like this right here, so I'm just going to knock that back a little bit. Of course, that's on the inside, so it's not really going to be seen. some of these little quirks in the design here like this little bump right there it's nice to even if you have like very smooth and round curves to every once in a while throw in something slightly angular to kind of break it up and add a little bit of variety Don't skimp on your legs. You wouldn't do it for a human character, so don't do it for an insect character. to, you know, as I'm developing these shapes, just kind of let them guide me as to where they want to go. It's nice to put in lines like this right here that are going to be reflective in the final model. You know, as the limbs turn around and the light hits it, those specular highlights reveal the form. So it's nice to have some subtle lines or maybe less than subtle lines here and there just so that the light changes as it hits it makes it a bit more interesting than just having something that's walking around on twigs. I think I got a little bit messy here, so I'm going to go in here and just add a bit of a curve. This would be a good time to step down and subdivision level, do a bit of smoothing. I'm letting that highlight right there kind of guide me as to making the um, adjustments. And it's I'm kind of fighting it a little bit though. I don't want to be too bent. And I think that's getting a little thin. Okay, so let's step up here. Okay. Let's bring this back and see how it's looking so far. Let's do a save next. Everybody's doing. How are you guys doing out there? <clears throat> so.
so thinking back to some of the designs I was looking at before, I had this kind of coming straight out of here. I might add a little bit of a bend there. I'll take this and uh, let's move this down a little bit because this has got a bit exaggerated. So pull this back and add something kind of like this to it. It's getting a little wobbly, but that's okay. We can fix it. Smooth that just to get rid of the wobbliness and then go back with the inflate brush. It lowers the intensity and just fatten it up a little bit. Lost too much volume there. I had to do it a few times to get it right. this up a little bit so it has a kind of space to fold in here. This is hinging in. I'm going to go down here to ask a cloth.
This one's a little bit tricky, but it's getting there slowly. I'm not quite liking it yet, but I believe that I can fix it. The main thing is to go with the flow, thinking about the flow of the shapes here. Let's see if I can fix it. I'm kind of doing a little bit of an echo of the design here from one limb to the next. This is getting too wobbly. using that sandpaper kind of idea to kind of refine this a little bit more without getting too mechanical looking. A little bit of lumpiness is good. It's, you know, positive lumpiness. Okay, so while that's auto-saving, I'll take a sip of beer. And I think I'm getting a little bit obsessed here. So what I might do is move on to the next segment and come back to that and see if I can fix it a little bit more. It's not too bad, but... I'm not quite happy with it yet. So let's do this. Let's go down here and see if we can fix this notch a little bit. So I'm going to use the uh, uh, Damien Standard Brush to come in here and holding the Alt key kind of start to maybe refine this notch a little bit. as well as this bottom edge, holding the Alt key to kind of give it a crisper kind of look to it.
going to duplicate this leg segment for the middle legs and probably lose the lot notch in this part. I don't know if we need it in the middle legs. It's something that's really just a feature of the front legs. So that it can clean the antenna. One thing I think is important when you're working on insects, if you're trying to replicate an existing insect, instead of just looking at still images, make sure you also look at videos on YouTube because sometimes seeing them in motion will reveal details that you don't see in just a still image. It also gives you a better idea of how the insect uses its different body parts. You know, um, there's some really great super slow motion uh, footage on a YouTube channel called Ant Lab. This one scientist has been filming high speed footage of insects for the past few years and just posting them all on YouTube is really worth checking out. It's very inspiring, especially if you're going to animate these guys. You know, um, one thing about animating insects is that each type of insect has its own kind of personality to the way that it moves. You know, beetles are surprisingly clumsy when they fly. And you can see this really, especially in slow motion. Also, when they swim, they just look like they're flailing around. It's quite ridiculous. As opposed to something that's much more elegant, you know, like a dragonfly which is going to have a very like sharp staccato movement as it flies around and also a very even hovering, hovering kind of thing. Whereas opposed to a bee, like a honey bee that is, it will hover as well, but it has kind of a meandering kind of hover to it. You know, it's like a, each insect has its own style. I think it's worth checking out. Excuse me. But you can see this work that I'm doing is making it look much more organic now, as opposed to the way like before, which was a bit more mechanical. Let me save this real quick. So all this work that I'm doing right now is going to pay off because, like I said, I'm going to duplicate this for the middle and hind legs and then just make alterations in the overall proportions and maybe some of the details here and there. But for the most part, the work that I'm doing now is going to be utilized again. So let's take this guy right here. I'm going to here. I mean, this, this actually looks more like a claw with an extra spike coming out. And I think this is probably for this particular wasp, and maybe it uses this segment right here to clean its antenna, as opposed to maybe a deeper notch. So it's maybe it's using this part. I have that coming, well, no, I have it coming out here, and then I have the notch down here. So this is more like a honeybee kind of thing, but I could have done it up here as well. But, you know, that's cool. I might make this look a little bit more threatening by putting a bend into it and sharpen it a bit. And even maybe pull in like kind of a sub segment here just for fun since we are kind of making up our own bug. We can kind of make up our own rules here and there. It depends on your bias. I tend to do things that are more closer to reality when I can, just because I like it. I'm going 
here and then I think next week when I do the live stream I'm going to start working on the wings so that should be fun Here we go. This kind of echoes this this design right here, which I think is kind of cool. That looks that's kind of a neat shape. Here, or I could use Damien's standard brush, doesn't really matter. I just want to kind of accentuate that, and then I'll add some various kind of notches right here just to give it a bit more of an organic field feel. Then go over with clay tubes just to give it a little bit of a shape. Two flare and let's go in here with uh, two different clay tubes and just kind of dig this out. Another um, group of insects to look at for some interesting uh, uh, leg design is, of course, beetles, dung beetles, any kind of beetle that, you know, digs or that kind of stuff. You can have some really cool features in their legs that have been adapted to allow them to do that. I highly recommend checking those out. Um, I really like the, uh, 
Rainbow Scarab Beetle, Rainbow, Rainbow Scarab Beetle, Phineas Vindex. That's a cool one. That's some really wild leg designs. As well as antenna. Almost there. Just a couple more segments to do, and we can duplicate this thing. All right, now we're down to the foot. Let's do a quick save. <clears throat> Make this a little bit more pointy and slightly more aggressive than the other segments of the foot. Tubes going. Mm -hmm. The legs can be a little bit tedious. You gotta find those cool parts of the forms, bring them out, make them look a little bit more interesting. Okay, now we're just down to the toes. 
claws, we're gonna call it. Let's bring this down below the subdivision level and get uh, move topological. I'm gonna pull this out a little bit. And then we look in the silhouette here, we got we can see that there are three parts. Alrighty. Go that to the highest subdivision level. Whoops. Escape cloth and just kind of exaggerate some of the lines here. Make it look a little bit more intimidating. I'm going to spend a whole lot of time on the toes unless it's something I'm really going to feature in a final render just because, again, it gets a little bit tedious. And most of the time, if I'm rendering or animating this, they're going to be really, really small, just a tiny dot. So in this case, I'm going to keep it kind of quick and simple. So you can always go back and refine these some more if you need to. Something on the side that needs to be really highlighted in any kind of animation or rendering. You can always make an insert mesh brush of various different insect parts and kind of kit bash them together. I've done that before, it can be kind of fun. I don't like to kid bash biology too much because I always like the idea that form follows function. So if you're just throwing, slapping stuff together, it's a, uh, I mean, it's not necessarily the worst thing in the world. You could rob a bank or something like that. That would be much worse. But, you know, it depends on how devoted you are to uh, accuracy. But it could also be a good starting point. And, depending on the kind of project that you're working on. Definitely for something where you're just trying to throw throw together, get some ideas going. Okay, so let's uh, zoom out. Let's turn off solo. Let the auto save and kind of see where we are. So, I mean, it's kind of cool. I, I do feel like it does fit with the rest of the design. You can see these little curve in here and from the side view it's looking kind of nice so I think it's eh, it's working pretty well maybe move these up a little bit Got some kind of weirdness going on here with the toes. Okay, didn't like that. I think part of the problem is these are twisted, so let's go down here and do this. And draw a mask over this, invert the thing back, invert the mask, 
and kind of fix the rotation of this a little bit. Pivot on that one part is off for some reason. That's a bug or something that I've done that's completely wrong. A bug and a bug. So I think uh, I'm going to ignore it for now. Let's just do this. Let's do edit, delete, undo history. going on there. What I'm going to do now though is I'm going to duplicate this, uh, let's rename it, let's call it front leg. And we're going to duplicate the subtool and rename it and call it mid leg. Let's move it down to its lowest subdivision level. And see if we can't. That one doesn't have the same problem. So that's good. At least so far. And we're going to kind of rotate this out. And maybe this a little bit. think about that just a little bit so it's bigger than the front legs. We can get rid of this. Make it a little bit bigger in the front legs, and let's pull this out just a little bit. And then I'm going to go in here and mask this, mask this, mask this, and Maybe rotate this back a little bit. Let's 
scale it up a little bit. Mask this, and then go down here. Better. Look at that, and then what I think I'm going to do is go in here and very quickly fill in this notch because I don't need a notch on this one because this is the middle leg. Move this and then use clay tubes to fill it in a bit. Bring up the Z intensity. Now, I say Los Angeles is a city of angels. I never found it to be quite that exactly. Well, there are some nice, nice folks that live there. I've never been to France and I've never seen no queen in her damn undies, as a fellow says. I tell you what, the story here I'm about to unfold. You can see just as, seen just as many things, as stupefying things you see in any of those places and in English. Uh, Jeff Lebowski he never called himself that was by the dude named the dude now dude is a name that no one would self apply where I come from okay enough of that silliness let's uh, clean this up a little bit and et voila Good enough for now, we can always go back and fix it a little bit more later. At least now we have some better looking middle legs. All right, take a look at the profile. And let's save this. Okay, so I got about seven minutes left, so I'm going to do a quick duplicate of this leg again, just to place it for my hind legs, and then uh, we'll leave it there for now. Next week, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to start working on the wings, so I think that'll be a bit more interesting. The legs are a little bit tedious, admittedly, um, but the wings are always kind of fascinating, and I've worked a long time on developing various techniques for creating wings, so hopefully you guys will enjoy that. Um, let's, uh, let's delete this. And let's take our mid leg and duplicate it. I'll go down a little subdivision level. quite a bit larger
There's a moon brush. And this thing's gonna look really strange until we get the wings in there. Once we get the wings in here, it'll start to read more as a wasp. It's gonna look kind of funky without them. But there we go. I think, you know, the rear legs will use a little bit more refinement going forward. We can make it a little bit more unique and interesting. But I think as uh, getting the basic gist of it, that works pretty well. Certainly looks like a bug. All right. So I'm going to leave it there for tonight. I'll come back and refine this a little bit more. Uh, but next week we're going to worry about wings. And so I want to thank everybody who uh, enjoyed watching this tonight or watched it regardless of their level of enjoyment. Uh, I certainly enjoyed working on it. But, you know, it's... Um, Sorry, I missed a few comments. Some comments are on the Twitch and some are on YouTube, so I apologize if I missed your comments. Um, for one question, how do you select a certain part of a single subtool? Sorry, I need to ZBrush because I'm doing that. Okay, so very quickly to answer, answer that question, hopefully a person's still around. Uh, the key to doing that is polygroups. So if I have the legs of the uh, this model as polygroups, each segment, and you can do that through using auto groups or manually creating auto groups or manually creating polygroups. Then what you can do is if I have the gizmo, I can alt click on a segment here or control click on it rather. <clears throat> that's going to mask everything but that selected polygroup. So then I can move it around, or I can invert and move the rest of it around. So that's one way. There's also the mask by polygroups feature. So that means uh, it's not going to work with the gizmo so much, but it will work with the sculpting brushes as I've been doing earlier. So I can move this part around without affecting this part. If I set mask by polygroup down to zero, then it's going to select all those parts. And then, of course, you can also do everything in between zero and 100. So if I set this to like 34, it's going to have a stronger effect on the first polygroup that I select than the other ones. Right? So that could be kind of an interesting way to shift it. But the key to working within a single subtool that's made up of multiple parts is polygroups. Polygroups are the key to mastering ZBrush. So spend some time learning how polygroups work. Spend some time working in the polygroup menu. There's so many different things you can do with polygroups and masking. That's what's going to allow you to uh, manipulate individual parts within a subtool. So hopefully you're still around and you heard the answer to that question. The short answer is polygroups, polygroups, polygroups. Um, that's how I've been doing it all night tonight. So hopefully that'll give you some uh, ideas there. And uh, next week we'll work on the wings for this, but I think it's it's coming along pretty well uh, overall. And um, this is a wasp, so it's going to have four wings. It's going to have um, two large uh, front wings and then two smaller hind wings. Most insects do actually have four wings, the exception being uh, insects within the order Diptera, which would be like flies and mosquitoes and that kind of thing where they have two wings and then two with two little nubby things known as halteres. And I'll talk more about how wings work as well um, next week, at least what I know of uh, insect wings. There's a lot to learn about that. There's people who spend their entire careers studying insect wings. I know what I know, so I'll share that and we'll see how it goes. I kind of feel like, well, I don't know, this might need to be thicker now or I might need to make these bits thinner somehow to balance it out because I think this is not looking it's looking incongruous now with a very thin waistline between the abdomen and the thorax whereas the legs are kind of thick so I might play with that at some point in the future to make it look a little bit more like they belong all together in the same bug but we'll save that for a later time thanks again hope you guys enjoyed the uh, live stream and I will see you next time